Welcome to Eurodollar University with Jeff Snyder, the head of global research at Alhambra Partners. My name is Emil Kalinowski, and you may have heard that the treasury curve has inverted, meaning recession is due, imminent. We're going to talk about some of those details, but we're going to go back in time to figure out when did this process begin? Because it just inverted, but when did we start moving towards inversion? We're going to ask Jeff to tell us the story that he wrote about in an article that was posted on the 28th of March, 2022 at Alhambra Investments. The title is Inversions in Inventory, the Major Products of October. And you start out the article, Jeff, by saying what happened in October. And you list a couple of candidates. You say crude oil, the price of oil went above $80 a barrel for the first time in a long time. There was a bad five-year treasury inflation protected security auction as well. But are those red herrings? I don't think they're complete red herrings, but I also don't think they're the complete explanation either. They're not comprehensive enough to explain everything that happened. And it's interesting how so many things point back to October that, you know, the list of suspects is pretty long anyway. So we really do need to get into more than, you know, we can't just say it's this thing or that thing. It's probably like everything else in, in life. It's a combination of things. And it's a combination of big things because, you know, let's face it, economies want to grow. Markets want to be normal. Yield curves and money curves want to be upward sloping. So it really takes a whole lot of something or a whole lot of some things to get these, to get the economy out of its place, to get the markets out of their place, to get curves starting to, to move in the wrong direction and be distorted to the point where they're going to be inverted. So you know, we're not saying it's one thing or it's another thing. It's a combination of things. But let's look at the, the whole list of combinations. And we've already talked about some of the other suspects. You know, we made our collateral case, you know, deep inside the monetary system, repo derivatives, repo fails, dealers borrowing treasuries from the Fed. All that's, We did that, a, 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 what was it, a week ago or so, a week or so ago. So let's look at some other uh, uh, factors beyond those. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, those monetary factors seem to be coinciding, not necessarily with October. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. I thought they were having more to do with late winter. And these, what we're going to discuss right now, might be an economic fundamental reason for the inversion. Correct me if I'm wrong. We, had this, we did have the spike in repo fails late September early and in, into early October mm -hmm. that did correspond with a rise in borrowing from prime... Or, primary dealers borrowing treasuries from the Federal Reserve. That was, again, late September, early October. So there was the collateral case for what happened in the yield curves at that time, too. But, you know, again, maybe that's why. Maybe there's a macro reason why the curve, you know, collateral started to become short. Maybe the collateral chain started to come back and uh, contract a little bit because of what was going on in the real economy at the time. And we should probably set the stage here first because, between early August and October 8th, the yield curve, like the euro dollar futures curve, these were behaving in the way that they were supposed to. Now, there could have been any number of reasons for that. We talked about it last year. I mean, there's, that, there's a seasonal quirk in, in the way the bond market works. But regardless of the reason, between early August and early October, that two-month period, the yield curve, not only did nominal rates rise a little bit, they, the yield curve steepened a bit. Not a whole lot, but it, it didn't compress like it had been beforehand. And the euro dollar futures curve, maybe more importantly, that had collapsed between uh, February and, and August. Euro dollar futures prices were falling, which meant that uh, the perception of future interest rates was rising. The euro dollar curve as a whole was steepening as it was rising. Those are the kinds of things that you want to see if you believe that we're going into a, a period of actual economic growth and maybe even a path to normality. So from that two-month period up until October, things were going kind of in the right direction. At least they were stopped going in the wrong direction in the way that they had been beforehand. And people may be wondering why October 8th, but we've just pulled up a chart that shows the spread between different tenors of the U.S. Treasury curve, the 10-year, 5-year, 10-year, 2-year. And you've put a nice, very helpful red dashed box that you can see the intersection here is on October 8th, where we saw... The good steepening, yes, good, and thereafter just straight down. And straight down to this day, right? It's almost like a straight line from October 8th to the moment we're talking. Mm. The, the yield curve just started flattening and flattening and flattening. Of course, now it's inverted. It's, it's, it's amazing. Quote by Jeff Snyder. 
Unbeknownst to most of the global public, Americans for sure, the U.S. goods economy has been the sole positive outlier in the constant ocean of post-2020 weakness. Uncle Sam juiced the domestic demand curve by simultaneously depositing borrowed treasury cash into the accounts of bored consumers who had already been trapped in their houses. Now we're segueing to the economic reason we suspect might be explaining why we saw that inflection on the previous chart in early October, Jeff. What, was, what are we leading towards here? Well, we're leading toward the supply shock, at least the one part, you know, the supply shock isn't a single instance. It's, a, you know, it's a, a series of events that happen together, one after another after another. And the initial part of the supply shock was, just as you read, Emil, you know, the government gave consumers who were trapped in their houses the ability to go out and shop on Amazon, not go outside their house, <laughs> but to go online and just buy goods. And that's what Americans did. Americans bought a tons of goods, at least those uh, who weren't devastated by the pandemic crisis response that, that basically destroyed the economy, uh, the, the people who were still working, people who still had good jobs, all of a sudden had money on top of the regular income, they spent it, which, I mean, that's that's kind of what was intended by you know, the, the government as, as well as the, ec the economists advising them. They wanted people to spend money and spend they did. The problem was production and shipping. The supply side of the economy just could not keep up to that rapid rush of demand. And so what happened was we had all of these, you know, one-off events that combined into create this uh, massive mess. And the, the primary uh, implication of it was that consumer prices started to skyrocket. They accelerated because small e economics says when demand shifts to the right and supply is inelastic, prices are the only way that the economy can adjust for it. However, that led to the second order effects, which was retailers and wholesalers see prices go up for the first time in forever since before 2008. At the same time, they, they can't get the goods that they've been ordering to satiate this consumer demand. They said, well, screw it. Let's just order a whole lot more goods than we actually need just to make sure that we have some product available. Because if it's if there's a problem getting getting products shipped from China in through the West Coast ports and then offloading on some railroad cars that are stuck in Chicago or not stuck in Chicago or getting enough truckers and chassis and all these other things, why not just over order and grossly over order to make sure something comes out of that mess into our hands so that when consumers who are willing to pay top dollar for goods, we can give them something. And that sounds terrific, right? It, 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 it you know. We just went through a recession and now there's too much activity. It, but it only, you know, it, it's, it's just the first part of the process. Quote by Jeff Snyder, as I've been writing since last summer, they, wholesalers and retailers, quite intentionally overordered, doubling, tripling, quadrupling up on goods just to hope some sufficient quantity made it through the gauntlet of port inadequacies, railroad turmoil, and a quote unquote shortage of truckers whose only fault is that they don't get paid to wait idle for those orders. Monday, March 28, 2022, the U.S. Census Bureau released wholesale and retail inventories. And the first chart that we're pulling up right now is the wholesale inventory data. It's seasonally adjusted, Jeff. You've done a calculation for us. It's the month over month change. We're looking at data from 2017, January, all the way to the most recently available data, February of 2022. And you very helpfully labeled three huge spikes. And in case we missed it, you put a big circle oval around it too. Jeff, would you be surprised that that first spike was October 21st? What is this spike exactly? October yeah, 21, not, not 21st. Yeah, October, October of 2021, that month, that month that keeps coming up in all of our financial market discussions. October 2021. And they weren't just big spikes in, in inventory. These are historic. And so three of the last five months, going back to October, we have multiple plus 2% changes. Not 2% year over year, 2% month over month. Just absolutely massive increases in inventory. Now, some of that is the price effect where the, the cost of goods have gone up as they've, if they've been produced and shipped. By and large, we've never seen a flood of inventory this big before, which gets back to that you know, second order effect that I just talked about, which is 
Eventually, if companies were over ordering in the first half of 2021, just to make sure goods got through, October 2021, the goods started to get through. And not only did they start to get through, they started to flood the system through. And so it's been five months up to, fe up to February, which is the latest data, where we've just seen epic amounts of inventory uh, show up in the supply chain. That runs a little bit contrary to popular perception, which is, you know, grocery stores are empty. There's empty shelves everywhere. We, hate, we keep seeing shortages. How can there be a flood of inventory if there's empty grocery shelves are all around the country? And that just goes back to, it's not that we no longer have the goods. It's very difficult to get the goods where they need to go. So they're sitting in the supply chain and maybe they don't get delivered to the grocery store on time, but more and more the goods are there. And here's the real big part here. There are more goods still coming. So the flood of inventory that we've had over those particular five months since October may just be the first part of the entire all that overordering from last year is finally coming home to roost. Next graph, Jeff, shows us data for retailers this time. Now from January of 2010 all the way to present, February 2022. And again, you can't miss it. There's this obvious increase after the corona crisis and the shutdowns. Then a little bit of a moderation. And then the first spike in a series of them, the most recent months, is November 21 when we see that surge. And that segues to a question that we received from an audience member. You can reach Jeff on Twitter at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. And this one comes from anti -claws, the anti -claws. How come inventory is such a bad thing, Jeff? Well, it's not it, by itself. It's always the context in which it comes into, right? Because the, the classic inventory cycle case was actually the business cycle case, which was Usually when we got into recession or the business cycle at large, it was because, you know, companies, retailers and wholesalers or, or order goods and they have to stock inventory to make sure they have enough goods on hand to meet consumer demand. And what used to happen was consumer de demand for whatever reason would fall off a little bit, which would mean that inventory still being shoved up the supply chain would start to accumulate, which meant that retailers and wholesalers would call up their manufacturers and say, look, we're accumulating too much inventory. This is too much. We got to call a halt. We're going to order less stuff from you. And if that kept going, where you know the supply chain got accumulated too much inventory built up, that would eventually lead to everybody starting to cut back. You know, manufacturers you start making less product, which means they're working their workers less, maybe even cutting back the number of workers, which fed into lower consumer demand, meaning more inventory showed up. But it, it was left unsold at retailers, and on and on and on in this self-reinforcing process that we know as recession. So it really depends upon inventory in relation to sales and where we are in the cycle. And if we're, if we're talking about the supply shock case where inventory cycle was sort of a unique uh, situation where retailers and wholesalers were just hoping to get goods, didn't really care about the future. It was sort of a epic case of short-termism. Then eventually they have, to, they have to deal with the flood of goods that do end up showing up at their door because they ordered the stuff. It got through the supply chain mess. It, and now they have to find a place to store it, which costs a lot of money. It erodes into profits. You have to hope that consumers continue to spend at the same pace that they were when you were ordering these things. And so a great deal of uncertainty. And the larger that inventory build becomes, the more and more likely it triggers that, it, that negative inventory recessionary process where retailers and wholesalers say, we've got too much stuff call up the manufacturers in China and Asia and say, you got to stop sending us stuff because we've got way too much as it is. And so that's really the implication here. And going back to our original premise here in, the, uh, in this episode, which was markets changing in October, you can see it in the marketplace. Euro dollar futures went from steepening to suddenly, wait a minute, flattening. And so the implication from the inventory part of our overall case is exactly that, that maybe there is going to be too much inventory, which is going to slow down and maybe even turn around what had been the lone bright spot in the entire global economy. U.S. consumers juiced up by Uncle Sam were spending money on goods, spending on money through Amazon on goods that were produced all around the rest of the world. So if U.S. consumers or if, if uh, uh, retailers and wholesalers in the U.S. say they've got too much goods already, and they stop that process, 
that can trigger the recessionary pattern, not just in the US, but around the whole rest of the world. So it would make sense that financial markets discounting future economic and financial opportunities started to see this inventory come into it. Because remember, the traders and participants in these marketplaces are those that are transacting with, with uh, participants in the real economy. So if they saw retail or, or wholesale and retail inventory start to pile up, they can put two and two together here and they begin hedging for this uncertain, maybe more certain downturn that we're starting to see come out of the marketplace into 2022. Financial media and market participants can put 10 and two together, Jeff. Earlier this week, the week of April 1st, April Fool's Day, which would be on Friday, the 10-year yield was below the two-year yield briefly during the day. Uh, I don't believe it closed that way. Surely this is now got into the public's attention. It surely will once we close below that on a, on a closing basis. Uh, but Jeff, often we're asked, what about the 10-year versus the three-month? Isn't that the classic measure? Isn't that the correct measure? Shouldn't, is 10-year, two-year not really official? And that question comes to us from at Massless Mind on Twitter. What about the 10-year, three-month? Yeah, that's another one. The other one beside the 10-year, two-year that the public has been told to pay attention to. But the way this inversion has worked, you're not going to see it up in the three-month until it's, it's almost imminent because the, th the short, end, short part of the yield curve like the short end of the euro dollar futures curve, is incredibly steep. And the reason it's incredibly steep is simply that the market expects that the Fed is going to start hiking rates as they have, and they're going to be able to keep going. And the reason they're able, they, there's two reasons why they're going to be able to keep going, because if we do fall into recession, which is a, is, a, is a good probability here, it's not immediately clear when that begins or how bad it will be. So there's some initial you know, fuzziness, the fog of recession, call it, for something like that. And the second part of it is the Fed has shown, a, and Fed and all central bankers have shown this predilection to just do their own thing regardless of reality. So once the Fed gets started on rate hikes, they're likely to continue on rate hikes regardless of what hap what's actually happening in the real economy until it becomes so overwhelmingly obvious that this is the wrong thing, which might take them some time. So the front end of the yield curve is saying, even if we do fall in recession, it's going to take some time for us to realize it. It's going to take a lot more time afterward for the Fed to realize it. And by then, they're continuing to hike rates. So it's no wonder the front end of the yield curve is deepening. So putting that in terms of the three months to 10 year spread, until we get closer to the, the normalization point where the market says, this is overwhelming, overwhelmingly obvious, you're not going to see a recession show up in the three month 10, 10 year spread in the same way that you've seen it in the long end. In fact, the inversion started with the seven-year tenure, and it's been creeping up the yield curve from that point. So it's moving, the inversion is moving from the back to the front. And because of the Fed and because of everything else in the curves, it just hasn't reached the front part yet. It doesn't mean you shouldn't pay attention to the three-month tenure spread, but that's not going to be a leading indicator in the same way as, say, the five-year to tenure spread has been, or the seven year to 10 year spread has been. So we had several signals corroborated. We had a commodity signal, oil prices surging, perhaps demand destruction taking pl place with those prices. We had a monetary measure, repo fails starting to increase also in October, just like oil. And we had a real economic measure, inventory piling up also in October. I wonder, should there ever be a recession if when the dating committee will decide it began, We'll see if they pick October, Jeff. All right. Thank you very much. All right, Emil. Take care.